Hello and welcome to this uh, special session at the Horasis India meeting. I'm Saurabh Shukla. I'm your moderator uh, for this session and we're joined by a very eminent panel today. Uh, we have, uh, you know, Navrut uh, Sehdev, who's the co-founder of Digital Economist, joining us now from Hawaii. Welcome, uh, Navrut. We have uh, Rishi Mehra, who's co-founder of Wishfin.com, uh, which is the largest B2C marketplace in India. We have Mohit, who heads, uh, who's the president of Infosys, joining us uh, from London. And we have Shreya Damani, uh, who is co-founder of Sky, SkyQuest Technology, uh, joining us. We will also have Pramod Bhaseen, who's uh, founder of uh, Genpact and also now co-founder of Clicks Capital, joining us very soon. Uh, we just lost him a minute back. Technology also has its own uh, challenges. Uh, that's what the topic today is, that uh, rapid digitaliz digitalization uh, is hoped, but, for, but is not always achieved. So just to set the ball rolling, at the time of COVID-19, uh, digital medium is something which is all pervasive. We, we, we are all, uh, even on this platform as we are conversing, is on a digital platform. In India, uh, millions of people now uh, are using technology to, uh, you know, not only empower themselves, but also make sure, uh, making sure that, you know, their daily chores are thanks to technology. But technology has also eluded them, especially when it comes to the last mile. You know, uh, the enormous migrant crisis India has had, uh, even though we have talked about a broadband revolution, but there are still challenges at the last mile. So today what we will attempt to do is largely be focusing on the India story, also, what are uh, the challenges and what is the future? Can digitalization really, uh, you know, get to the last mile and actually be the enabler? That is something that we'll be focusing on. Uh, to uh, set the ball rolling, uh, let me get you in, Mohit. What do you think uh, are the big challenges? Uh, why is that that it hasn't really trickled in to the last mile? So look, I think I'd start off with a more uh, optimistic uh, outlook at the start. Sure. Uh, speaking from, a, first of all, from a global perspective, if we look at the crisis we're in just now, right, this global pandemic, you've seen a globally synchronized shutdown of the world economy happening over the past three months. And I have to say that if we look back at this time, we should look back with a huge degree of optimism, right? Because if you told me a year ago, the world would be shut down for three months and you know we'd still be here still be having this virtual conference uh we wouldn't be worried about supply chain shutting down we wouldn't be worried about civic unrest we wouldn't be worried about a shortage of medicines i would call it revolutionary so the fact that the world as a whole has fared quite well despite the most extreme stress test i think is uh, is grounds for uh, celebrating the fact that digitization that the virtual economy and actual on the ground supply chains have held up pretty well. I think the same is true for India as well to a very great degree. The infrastructure that the country's invested in over the past uh, 10 years or so, starting with Aadhaar, moving on to GST, the digitization of payments is all very positive. And I think without it, uh, we'd be in a much, much deeper hole. Right. Navroop, I want to get you here. Uh, what's your sense? Do you see digitization as actually uh, being an enabler? in the current uh, scheme of things as we see it now? Yeah, so, you know, I agree with Mohit for the most part that most of the on-ground work in terms of the supply chains have, um, uh, you know, we've seen that the world is still going around and the, the bare minimum is happening. But I think it also kind of begs the question, um, how much globalization is too much globalization? Right? How much digitization we need to get to optimize processes from an from an economist point of view? I think what we're looking at is what we call search costs and transaction costs, right? Which is what digital technologies have the the, the a role in in massively reducing around the world, right? So that transforms uh, the role of organizations, the role of governments, um, how different stakeholders around the world can sync up. Um, so really for me, you know, the question of rapid digitization is really about getting to that last mile. It's it's an answer to that. And it's also something that needs to be validated. Uh, I don't believe it is that straightforward. 
right? Where I think there's very core, basic, baseline development work that needs to be done and the way we need to reach people. And the digitization agenda is, in fact, secondary for many economies, I think, including India, which is also why we've not seen it. I think there's, you know, these pull factors which is which is good. You want to be at the cutting edge in in the world. So, including for enterprises from India, but this is what is I see as a, as a push factor in in pushing uh, digitization further because that's what we need to rely on. Also, the unique nature of the crisis. Not to forget uh, the pandemic, the, the social distancing. Uh, if it was a different type of crisis, it would have been slightly different. I, I think. Sure. We have Pramod Basin also joining. Pramod, welcome. I, I know we were just discussing a short while back that how digi- digitalization also has its own challenges. Uh, technology fails us sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so Pramod, uh, you know, uh, coming to the question to you, you've been working with a lot of governments now. I know that you've been advising them uh, on the uh, digital uh, mantras, so to say. So, just talk us through about that. Uh, what has been your experience? Do you think it has been a real enabler? And what are the challenges that you see as you implement these strategies? Um, thank you. I, you know, my work <laughs> is very unstable. So I don't know if any of you can hear me or not. I, um, we, we, But yeah, I hope can. you can. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, go on. But um, yeah, I, I keep... And that I think is the is the straight. I, I I honestly think digitization has not progressed in India the way it should. It has in a few pockets, but it Okay. I'm I I uh, lost you there, Pramod. Yeah. Okay, we've sorry we uh, lost Pramod again. I'll go to uh, Rishi now. Rishi, you've been working on fintech uh, for a long time now, and uh, you guys are doing some uh, pioneering uh, work there. Tell me, how can fintech be the enabler, especially when it comes to digitization in the rural area? Say, yeah. Especially when you see the migrant crisis, a lot of migrant laborers have now gone to the villages. The government has now announced that 116 districts they're going to focus on. How can that? Uh, how can you solve the problem? Yeah, so I will talk about numbers here. See, so digitization depends upon two mediums. One is having an internet access and having a smartphone. Now, you know, 50% of Indian population, that's about 650 million, have an access to, uh, you know, to uh, internet connection. And then if you talk about smartphone to actually do a digitization process, uh, only 32% is actually achieved in that. So these are the two ingredients to the idea to identify, which would have caused digitization at the last mile across on that. And then talking about internet connections Normally, in rural all areas. The time, and as a result of our habits changing, promote, people will promote, adopt promote, this. I and I hope sorry. it creates a real demand. Uh, Pramod, uh, I'll just interrupt you. We lost you there. I'll just come back to you. I'll just finish with Rishi. He was just carrying on. Just yeah. give me one minute. Rishi, go on in. So uh, the kind of users you have is about 290 million users you have on the on the rural side. And then you were talking about the fintech and talking about, say, uh, yeah. what started in 2017 as monetization, etc. Uh, it has helped a lot of creating a lot of accounts so that government could pass on, uh, you know, to these benefits to the, to the accounts, etc. Uh, so, yes, if you've seen, you know, there was processes which were you couldn't open an account while, visit, you know, you have to visit a branch, etc. on that front. So, yes, the, there are been layers that have been formed. Yes, the layers are still, you know, we call it that there's a book that which has a cover already in the fintech industry. Right. But the inside papers need to be solved across on that front. Uh, so we've reached to a certain space where consumers are there. There are transactions happening on digital. Uh, you know, there is uh, a lot of phones which have the access to make payments, in etc. Et so on the side. But it is still far off. But yes, we have achieved 30 to 40 percent. And there's still much more to be done across on the front. Right. Uh, Pramod, can you hear me now? Uh, Pramod, can you hear me now? Can we? I can, okay. but I'm sorry. Uh, it's very uh, unstable. Uh, so no, no, uh, okay, I'll I keep say doing it. Hear a internet connection. I, I, just get, yeah. I think it. Yeah. 
I'll just video. let uh, Shreya in for a quick comment and then I'll get you in. Uh, Shreya, I'm, what do you think? Uh, sorry, how can, you should how go, can I don't we, want to interrupt anything. Yeah, how can I? Uh, how can we overcome this challenge of uh, di digitization not reaching the last mile in many cases? So, uh, first of all, I think I agree to what Mohit has said. I have more positive outlook con considering NIC has c come up with so many, um, so many apps. Uh, I, I was just while, you know, before coming in here, I uh, sort of wanted to make a note of what has NIC actually done and how are we reaching to uh, rural India. So um, government of Bengal has come up with an um, educational uh, portal for all its municipal school and they have shown some uh, users. I mean, TikTok is a classic example of how uh, uh, a Chinese app, I mean, I'm just giving you a parallel. I think uh, uh, sometimes digital Digitization is not only about the infrastructure, it is about adoption and the consumer push uh, to uh, sort of use it. And I think I'd like to bring that angle uh, here. And COVID has been able to uh, bring in that consumer uh, uh, push to start adopting these technologies. So I feel in terms of infra infrastructure, a lot is available uh, uh, at the last mile. I think it's about consumer adoption now and what actually the uh, user at the root rural end things can be done digitally and cannot be done uh, uh, digitally and uh, I think that uh, has to be uh, the conversation here and uh, to overcome these challenges I think uh, a lot of work needs to be done on the consumer uh, behavior uh, side uh, not necessarily just on the infrastructure. Right. Uh, Pramod, uh, I can just ask you quickly what do you think uh, can be done on the on areas like telehealth because that's something which will be really required when it comes to covid-19 crisis on telehealth can you can you hear me well i apologize i'll move on to uh, Mohit, now Mohit, uh, you know, coming to, uh, you know, an area like, say, telehealth, uh, because which can be critical at this time, you know, both in rural and urban communities where uh, people are really, really uh, looking to get the right uh, medical advice, but obviously are scared to actually visit a hospital or hospitals are overwhelmed. Where can that, uh, you know, uh, how can that be a game changer? So look, uh, Saurabh, I think uh, telehealth has the potential to be a huge game changer, not just in uh, in India, but even in the West, right? Even if you look at uh, a country like the US or if you look at the UK, there is still a huge reliance on the primary care physician or your GP that you have to visit in person. And I think the challenge is a couple, you know, I think there are three broad challenges, right? One is setting up the infrastructure, for instance, such that doctors and patients can communicate in a secure fashion via either the phone or via video. I think that's the first thing, getting that system up and running. And you've seen several uh, you know, private enterprises, you've seen several governments setting up that infrastructure. I think the second issue is uh, concerning the, the various regulations, right? The liabilities that exist, for instance, for being able to diagnose remotely. So making sure that the contractual framework which even today is very much based on a person-to-person -person interaction. Uh, that uh, contractual framework is actually uplifted to account for the new reality of uh, development. I think the third thing is, while a consultation may be possible via video or via consultation may be possible on the phone, that's a huge improvement over uh, what you have now. Uh, really, the other elements of the supply chain, right? For instance, the pharmacies, the uh, diagnostic health centers, uh, all of these will also need to uh, pitch in because you just cannot have a system which is only consultation based. Uh, so, for instance, I can converse with a doctor, tell him my symptoms, uh, but then for everything else, I still need to go, uh, you know, maybe to get a blood pressure check done or to get a blood test done or to pick up my medicines. The entire ecosystem needs to be synchronized to get together. And then, obviously, over time, you can inject other elements like, you know, artificial intelligence you know, a smart chat, some amount of IoT elements of it so that basic uh, diagnostics can be done using your phone or your home equipment. I think there's a lot of work to be done. Clearly, the first thing is getting the physician and the patient access so that they can have a secure private dialogue. 
but then other elements of the supply chain need to catch up for it to be truly effective right uh, navroop coming to you uh, since we're talking about health how do you make sure that you get uh, you know the digitization impact to communities where you, you don't have access to internet or quality internet because for instance say in a situation like this uh, which we are encountering as well where uh, we can't hear one of the panelists so uh, you know you can't have a doctor actually prescribing something and the patient hearing uh, half of the prescription or mm-hmm. or doing something you know obviously wrong you know which is different in the face to face how do you reach to communities which are not really well served uh, with digital technology yeah you can't you know the simple answer is you can't right so then there's the push around getting them on the internet right so then the question comes around access to the internet and then the entire push around this being actually a human right in in the 21st century and there's a reason for that because the internet is exaggerating the gap between exacerbating the gap between uh those who are able to leverage this technology set of technologies and everything that it enables and those who those who don't right so uh, starting with the fact that when we are when we're really talking about like the bottom of the pyramid around food shelter clothing digitization is not on the agenda right first and foremost um why are we talking about digitization the answer to me to my understanding is to be able to achieve scale rapidly right being able to reach what uh, populations um entire populations which otherwise would take very long and it did right starting from world war 2 when we started to see uh, democracies around the world the, the world uh, you know colonies coming to uh coming to an end so we saw a new era and it would take decades to reach certain populations but now that could be uh that th- that leapfrogging can happen right through digital tech so yeah. the answer is by giving them access finding ways to to get them uh on board but i think it's important to take a step back and ask is that the goal in itself one of the problems that i see with digitization with is is to is the lack of understanding is why are we trying to get people to adopt digital technologies right is this for developmental work or is it for just because we you know like technology right and i think the answer to that uh, has has to uh, has to be clear i mean there are cultures that are also getting destroyed which is a little off track i guess on 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 this panel because this is a panel on digitization but yeah. you know uh tribal populations indigenous populations we are in fact destroying their ways of life by superimposing um digitization uh, technologies that uh you know is interfering with the way they've traditionally lived over uh, over millennia great no i think it's a very good argument although i would also add to this and say that internet to me is also uh, has led to a lot more freedom if you see what's happening across the globe uh, uh, you know a lot of people who did not have a voice now have a voice thanks to uh, the uh, you know internet being more democratic uh, over to rishi tell me you know we are now looking uh, for some solutions as well uh, do you see you know as taking on from nagut's argument as well do you see that at some stage governments should make it mandatory of having say internet and internet freedom and internet the fact that access to broadband connectivity as a basic right as something which you know obviously you should be having it because it gives you a lot more access than run just entertainment or pure play communication um uh, i fully agree with you see i think uh the ingredients of living life i think one of these factors would become an internet as a part and part of life living on internet because what we've seen around what happened in covid internet become a backbone of a lot of industry people and medicine and has to be you know but still uh, in rural india there are other problems there is not enough electricity you know for to give an internet you have to have electricity first to be you know those mobile phones can be charged etc on that yes there has been a comprehensive improvement that has happened over the years but there is still when you talking about reaching to the last mile uh, the electricity and the internet has to be given and i think secondly the most important thing as you were talking about is 
do we have an access to people who can actually uh, use internet uh, and use internet for their own development and betterment uh, because what you are talking about is adaptability to internet in 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 an age between 15 to 21 is very different and for certain sets of people who are already above that age the adaptability to internet is not that great so i think we have to solve all those problems we have to solve the middle layer problems of getting internet and getting uh, internet available as cheap as possible because if you had seen around what has happened in india has been because the cheap internet started getting available in 2007 2008 once it has happened a lot more people are on the internet across on that front uh, so i think when you want to go down to rural india you need to have these basic infrastructures available uh, yes they are available they are much better but and the third part is how do you ensure the middle layer or the consumer experience and the consumer experience is not about we are talking about the elite we are talking about the consumer experience of a person who is not well read enough to understand the technology at the last mile and use it for its own betterment i think these are the three most critical points that are required to ensure that in rural india that you uh, you know the internet and digitization would help at that point of time right mohit uh, you know i'll ask you the same question do you see uh, you know the governments now or or getting into you know because we need to revisit our fundamental rights as well you know in for instance uh, uh, we always have to look at that the world is moving and covid obviously will uh, bring in some changes to legislations to thinking of governments across the globe do you see uh, you know digitization as the basic fundamental right that everybody should have and do you see it the governments across the globe working towards that <coughs> i think it will be hard to describe what digitization as a fundamental right could be if i look at it the basic right to you know to identity for instance right you already have that existing uh but quite candidly i i think digitization uh, would fall fairly low down the sort of chain for me in terms of rights that need to be assured you still have you know employment you know food uh, healthcare education as uh, fundamental issues where the state still needs uh, or is still getting its act together so i think digitization would come you know somewhat down the food chain i also feel that we shouldn't really uh, fall form of false dichotomy right of digitization versus the real economy uh, the two have to be very closely in sync and in fact i think one of the challenges that we've had in india so far if you compare it with uh, you know with the experience of china for instance right the shortage of real world infrastructure whether it's sort of high speed trains or whether it is uh, cold supply chains or whether it is the infrastructure at ports or as rishi mentioned uh, the need to have you know electricity for instance being assured the absence of these uh, real world physical supply chains uh, means that any degree of digitization really will not go beyond mere entertainment right if we're talking about uh, digitization serving the real needs at the last mile in terms of provision of goods and provision of services they really need a very robust physical supply chain to go uh, along with it i feel the government has provided the underpinnings of a legal infrastructure they provided the underpinnings of uh, let's say the identity and the payment infrastructure and maybe some sort of consent sharing infrastructure uh, in some instances it might be possible to leapfrog it so you might leapfrog the need for hospitals by creating the sort of telehealth system sort of that you refer to but in many other instances right you will still need an adequate emphasis on the real world physical infrastructure and i almost feel that we shouldn't present the two as alternatives they almost have to go hand in hand to you know for like i said for the provision of the services and goods that are so desperately needed right uh, shreya what do you think do you uh, agree with mohit uh, what he's saying that obviously uh, while i completely get his point that uh, digitization will not be at the top of the chain there are other essentials that are still required and we can maybe look at hybrid model uh, what is your sense yeah you mute i think yeah. i think digitized uh, digitization as a cross cutting uh, uh, parameter i don't see it as one of the parameters so for example uh, if i uh, want farmer uh, double uh, i want to uh, double small holding farmer income i would want to use agritech technologies to do that and i would have a policy which would have a, a digital uh, you know sort of layers uh, 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 to it in uh, in that sense 
so i don't see uh, this as a, a hierarchical thing where you would uh, ensure uh, sanitation and uh, uh, minimum wages and then uh, a digital digitization i would see this as a more cross cutting uh, parameter which is uh, sort of uh, under un uh, powering each of these aspects so this is how i see it uh secondly i uh, also feel that a lot of regulatory work around privacy data policy i mean we do have a data policy bill uh, sort of laid out but that needs to also uh, be brought in uh, to uh, strengthen all of these uh, uh, from the regulatory perspective and making it a basic need uh, uh perspective uh, i think those aspects have to be touched upon so that these policies can be implemented uh, far uh, Yeah. Okay. Uh, Navroot, uh, uh, Shreya really raised the point about privacy. Okay. Uh, do you see that a lot of communities uh, are reluctant to use digital technology or are not embracing digitization because of privacy concerns? And there is that that is where uh, the governments and stakeholders have to make sure that that assurance has to be explicit. Uh, do you see that as a challenge? I think it's the opposite. I think uh, consumers are not aware enough, and a lot of consumers and users, uh, perhaps is a better term, would give away uh, a lot of data. I mean, Facebook is a prime example, right? Um, in lieu of some of the service that they are getting, and what that is leading to is that big corporates have this enormous amount of data. right that they can then uh leverage to do whatever uh so the 2016 presidential elections in the US are a case in point right it it was a scandal it's still a scandal on how you can have very targeted um ads um and one of the things that i really like to share talked about was around adoption and i think the other side of this is the fact that um we're seeing a lot of behavioral change right so if uh, this triple crisis as i call it the the health the economic and also the social crisis because it's massive wealth transfer that's happening towards the richest in the world right now which i think is is a big issue right and digitization is an enabler to that and same way you know we are seeing that there aren't enough uh, rights of citizens and privacy concerns that are not being addressed the use of data that is not uh done in a clean way that is actually leading to massive abuses at 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 a at a global scale uh the cost of data breaches around the world is is in multi billion dollars and would be uh in i think around 6 trillion dollars in the next um 5 years or so so uh, i mean it's point on what i just said that that has to be the first i mean you know folks who are worrying about the next meal are not going to be worrying about their privacy right that goes without saying that's the responsibility yeah, sure. of the government and those that are using massive amounts of data uh to champion for that lobby for that um and and make sure that those rules are in place right uh, over and beyond just like the baseline um regulatory work again i think you know it comes down to what can be uh, ultimately withheld um so you know you have rights but if your rights are being encroached upon if you don't go to court and the courts don't uphold it it doesn't mean anything right so what we are seeing is repression that sort of goes over and beyond that and i think my concern here um is that digitization is enabling that as long as it continues to um centralize you know information and data now we can of course talk about decentralized structures and that is a solution to enable the rapid digitization which i think is interesting and something i've been working on over the past 5 years right right um mohit uh, what is your take on that do you agree with what navroop is saying or would you uh have a different take on this no i think look this is a this is a real concern uh and there has been a lot of uh, lot of work that has gone into explaining uh, why consumers actually are making the choices that they are to trade their data very freely when in many cases they should not be right i also feel that uh, you know that in india actually remarkably the government has been sort of uh, fairly far sighted in terms of putting up a data consent policy for instance so you can choose who you want to share your data with 
because in many cases if you take the example of financial data for instance right you may want to share the details of your financial data with a lender but only for you know only for that one instance right and not have it you know out there for all times so uh, the new uh, data consent and data sharing policy i think will be very useful from a health perspective and from a, a financial services perspective again the imperative is on governments to ensure that the underlying legislation is sound that as the group mentioned the legislation can be implemented in uh, courts uh, briefly the imperative also is on us as individuals as consumers uh, to ensure that uh, we are making the right choices when it comes to sharing uh, you know very private uh, financial healthcare and other information about ourselves so it's not just the, the governments cannot protect us from ourselves if we are making stupid choices uh, then we have to up our game as well right uh, rishi you know uh, my I, next question sorry, is you can I jump in here um, so i've just respond to what yeah, yeah, quick, quick response to me, you know, then go on and then i'll go to rishi yeah, no, go on okay yeah just just a quick point there i, I agree i mean i think we, we are assuming an enlightened end user an enlightened consumer which is not always the case and nobody has the time to read a massive terms and conditions on every single you know place you sign up for so what has to happen is corporate responsibility um and the fact that those who know more so there's something called information asymmetries always in the markets right uh the companies know much more what they do with the data than the consumers would ever know they need to be held accountable for their practices there has to be uh fair practices and transparency uh in in the markets i mean uh this i think this whole um neoliberal uh conversation and take on the usage of data just doesn't work and we've seen this failing massively over the past 20 years yeah okay but who's going to enforce it? Rich, who's going yeah. to enforce it? will the state need to enforce it would you be in favor of the state deciding yeah, for each yeah, and every single company would be appropriate data. who's going to enforce it if you have the state enforcing it, then it's you know you move from new level to new fastest very quickly we we we'll, we we'll, we'll have to uh, look for a hybrid solution here mohit uh, going to you rishi tell me you know before i was coming to this session a lot of people in fact uh, i was asking for a feedback what what is that i should be focusing on uh, you know one of the challenges a lot of people uh, and i will go back to my earlier question of people not really trying to embrace uh, digital technologies this worry the oh, especially when it comes to financial sector all the more worrying and this problem grows uh, across uh, regions where a lot of frauds are happening you know from a consumer standpoint what and how can the governments uh, make sure here you know i lost i lost rishi as well okay we will come back to rishi but uh, okay mohit let me ask you this question you know since you uh, uh you know are with a big company like infosys can there be a solution to this to reassure a customer especially in the financial sector uh to make sure there's a fraud free regime because you know people are really scared i know of people who are even scared to you know uh actually link their bank accounts to you know a digital payment solution look i think uh you know uh, there has been fraud in the financial system since uh the past uh, you know 5000 years right ever since you've had debt ever since you've had uh, financial transactions there's always been fraud i think uh, uh, it's a double edged sword on the one hand uh, you know the new data technology allows us to detect uh, fraud fairly quickly and allows us to detect sort of uh, unusual patterns and there may be fraud behind it uh, but equally the proliferation of uh, you know of digital technologies allows for a degree of social engineering right where you can call somebody and you can you know uh, persuade them to provide their identity to carry on a transaction so it certainly calls for you know sort of more checks and a, a, a higher degree of uh, prudence from the financial institutions particularly individual consumers as well uh, to be you know to be uh, more careful I, i agree with you i think it is a scary world out there Uh, but there is no choice there is no choice but to be sort of online and digital especially given the fact that cash is pretty much disappearing from our economies right i mean in the uk for instance we've seen the levels of atm usage go down by something like 6 to 15% every year and then after the crisis it has fallen by a further half so cash is really disappearing from you know from our economies and therefore that means that the choice to go digital is not really a choice anymore for most consumers 
Right. And also in a post-COVID world, I think it will only uh, add to it even further. Where you, you don't right. need a contact. So right. people right. obviously would want uh, contactless payments and, you know, payment phones and all. Uh, Thousands of uh, bacteria yeah. and virus on every single currency note. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's look for solutions specifically at the time when the world is grappling with COVID. Nabu, where do you see digitization, especially when I again bring you back uh, to India's context where, you know, you had a huge influx of migrant laborers going back to uh, their villages now. Now the challenge uh, before the government is they've announced a scheme uh, to make sure they get the right skill set. Do you see that uh, uh, digitization can actually help in getting those people jobs around the areas they are? No, I don't. I think it's very optimistic um, because, you know, the reason why these people are walking for hundreds of miles home is because if they don't have, you know, cash in hand by the end of the day, they don't have a meal for next day. I think us talking about digitization in the context of, you know, that last mile is a little delusional. Um, you know, we can discuss it in the context of those of us who have access to internet. Um, but again, I think Mohit mentioned this previously, there is baseline infrastructure that needs to happen. Now, of course, it's a, they are connected, um, uh, you know, on and off through mobile technology. So that could be pretty powerful. For, so without the state becoming a surveillance state, I think there are ways to leverage digital tech and, for example, send alerts, right? Um, what What's baffling for me is just the way the government, without getting political, does things. Like, there's no um, warning whatsoever, right? Like, in the U.S., we knew days before that, okay, this city is going to get locked down on a certain date, so people could prepare. Um, that's just completely lacking. It's just, I think, the, the respect for just basic human life is... Um, is the first uh, first thing that has to happen. And then once you start there, then you can start to leverage tech to provide people with the support and then help them find solutions and, and not, you know, for surveillance and, 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 and not for, 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 for us, I guess, in a way that um, it's disconnected. I think uh, I've been mentioning this throughout the panel here, um, and and, and um, uh, really, I think, uh, you know, we need to have a sort of a realistic take on what it's, it's really going to take. I am optimistic, though. The world is connected through mobile technology. There is um, uh, a lot of potential. And uh, what we need to do is push that through, you know, through, through that channel on whatever solutioning we can provide. Contact tracing apps have been around the world. At this point, you know, so this is these are voluntary. You can sign up, you can sign in, and 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 you know they crowdsource um, the the data around the world. Uh, the other, I think, is of course alerts, uh, push notifications that governments can give. Um, uh, right, the yeah. uh, sure. for sure. example. Uh, I'd like to just add I, something to what Navlu uh, said. Yeah, sure. yeah, I'll come to you. I'll just uh, yeah yeah. Uh, yeah, just just go on. Okay. So I was just saying that I think a massive uh, impetus has to be given to skill development to create jobs because all those migrant workers were not really doing some digital jobs in the urban economy. I think when they would be going back, I think there has to be a whole lot of uh, thought given around uh, skill development and how would they ad uh, adopt to newer jobs that they would be taking up in these rural uh, uh, economies. So I think I just wanted to add that point. Okay. Uh, Rishi, we got yeah. you cut off. So let's, you know, because we have only uh, three minutes, 58 seconds left now. Okay. But uh, we are looking for solutions now in the post-COVID world. Where do you see digitization uh, serving as an enabler for the last mile impact? Yeah. So I think you have to look into the industries where, uh, you know, where digitization was not even adapted as, you know, there was a lot of a touch and feel factor. Imagine no real estate was sold because it was about visiting and then deciding. Uh, imagine no cars, you know, people looked at cars. There were a lot of content that was available on Internet, but there was no booking happening across on that track. You know, when you question what is digitization, digitization is how much percentage of the economy is actually digitized. 
So now if you look at those parameters and see certain economies where the digitization percentage of the economy was really high. So you have to, uh, and in the large ticket size transactions were not actually digitized. So if you look at it in that format, whenever the amount was smaller, $50, $100, $150, these were products which were sold or bought on internet. Uh, As soon as the amount went higher, the digitization didn't happen. I foresee with the COVID happening across on that front, forcing people to look at higher ticket size uh, things and they will buy and digitization would come day in and day out to these kind of processes where people will actually book a car or I'll just stop and promote this here, promote, welcome back. I just get your quick point in. Where do you see digitization being an enabler in a post-COVID world? Promote. Yeah, go on, promote. You're live now. Can you hear me, promote? Okay. That yeah. here, what uh, Rishi just mentioned, I think what yeah. you really talked about is the trust issue. Um, the fact that the uh, the economy is still reliant on uh, a you know person to person sort of trust, uh, right? And and moving to digital infrastructure, uh, we need to reimagine, rethink, and redo the ways that we trust each other. And so that's a lot more of a behavioral. Uh, societal thing than it is a technology thing to hack. Um, so I, again, sort of coming back to the first point here, what I think the pandemic does, it pushes forward um, humans to search for new ways to interact, right? New ways to, to trust each other. Um, and technology and digitization is is an enabler uh, along the way. Right, right. Uh, Mohit, uh, just quick uh, last yeah. word from you and I'll Ah, sure. right, yeah. no. So just a couple of things. There's two things. One is, uh, as we try and look to see what lessons we can learn from this uh, pandemic and what we can apply to economies, I think two things come to my mind. One is, if you look at the pandemic, the larger companies pretty much across the world have actually... I'm losing you. I think, you know, we are running... Time. Uh, we're running out of time, but it has been a great panel. Uh, Mohit, I'll, I'll have to be, we're just running out of time, and I think it's going to shut after that. But thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. It has been a great panel. We've come up with some solutions, and I know uh, that we are all optimistic. This panel is optimistic about the impact digitization will make in a post COVID world. Uh, thank you for joining. We did have uh, some difficulties on the tech issue, but I'm sure. Uh, digitization is also enabler in some ways. Uh, we missed uh, promote, but uh, thank you all uh, other panelists for joining in today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.